Welcome to the Department of Entomology's Virtual Barn Exhibit for Plant Science Day 2020. My name is Dr. Kirby Stafford. I'm the Chief Scientist or Head of the Department of Entomology and the State Entomologist. And together with Dr. Gail Ridge, who runs our Insect Information Office, we're presenting uh, here today Murder and Maggots, an Introduction to Forensic Entomology. Forensic entomologists can help solve crimes, often by estimating the postmortem interval or time since death based on fly maggot development or other arthropod evidence. Blowflies in the family Califoridae are the first insects to arrive at decomposing remains, such as a corpse, to lay eggs. They are the primary group in most forensic analysis being found on fresh carrion. The group includes green bottle flies, blue bottle flies, and black blow flies. The green bottle fly, and you may commonly see these around your picnic uh, area, are common early arrivals at crime scenes. And the black blow fly is a common fly at crime scenes, but it tends to be a somewhat later arrival at carcasses than some other blow fly species. The graph on the left shows you the development of a fly. The female fly will arrive and lay eggs, and then first instar larvae will hatch from those eggs. As they grow, they will then uh, molt or change into second instar or stage larva, and then after they continue to grow, become third instar or stage larva. And then that larvae will swell uh, after a period of migration and, and as it finished feeding, forming a puparium or pupal case and the fly pupates inside and then later emerges as the adult fly. So when you come across fly evidence, you're going to find some stage of the fly. And the idea is to work backwards to estimate when those eggs were laid. This is somewhat analogous to a human pediatric growth chart shown on the right, where if you looked at, the, for example, the length of the child or weight of the child based on development curves, you can work backwards to a pretty good estimate to the time of birth. And we're doing something similar for the flies. So when you're doing an inquiry, you're looking at there's a time of death, as you see here, and then a time interval will pass until the discovery of the victim or corpse. And with that, there may be some insect evidence. And this could be anything from on the flies, from a leg, egg, various stages of the larvae, uh, all the way up to the pupa or adult fly. So we're looking at the development from egg to adult. And then here, what you're gonna do is work backwards to estimate this post-mortem interval. And there will be a maximum and minimum estimate or range uh, on that estimate that'll approximate the time of death or when the victim was at first ex uh, exposed to the flies. Now, fly development is closely tied to temperature. And this graph shows temperature over time used to calculate what we call accumulated degree hours or days to estimate development. It is known uh, how much uh, or how fast uh, flies develop at a given temperature. So if you look here, you'll see there's a developmental threshold below which there is no uh, maggot or fly larval development. And then here, at, at some parts of the year, like the fall and winter, you'll see nighttime temperatures will drop below this developmental threshold. Uh, during the summer, it may never drop below that threshold here with temperatures a little lower at night, rising in the day and that. And so you can use the temperature over time to calculate the development of the fly. So let's look at a Connecticut case study. The badly decomposed body of a young woman was found in woods a short distance behind a slaughterhouse in Bloomfield, Connecticut on Thursday, August 18th of 2015. She was reported last seen alive at 11 p.m. on Thursday, August 11th. Now the maggots had consumed much of her face, neck, and upper chest and were removed from the body by the medical examiner and then subsequently delivered to the Connecticut Agricultural Experiment Station. 
that all of the 600 maggots that we had uh, received were third in the star larvae of the black blow fly Formia regina. We obtained hourly temperature data from a nearby weather station for that period from August 11th to the 18th. And there was no evidence that these larvae had begun what we call the post-feeding uh, phase, I had actually left the body or had actually pupated. Now, the, we measured all of these uh, maggots, and the length of a few exceeded 14 to 15 millimeters in length, while the average for most was 10.5 millimeters, as shown in the graph here on the lower right corner. So both the accumulated degree hours, and this data is not shown, and the larval size were used in estimating that post-mortem interval, or when the black blowflies first access the body, and also when most of the black blowflies access the body. The oldest maggots were laid 6.6 .6 days before the maggots were collected, which would be August 12th, and most were laid 4.6 days before the maggots were collected, which would be August 14th. And based on that, we estimated that the first black blowflies arrived on the woman's body on August 12th, the day after she disappeared, with most fly activity occurring on August 14th. Now remember, the post-mortem interval, we're going backwards in time. So this chart it goes backwards. So we actually start at the bottom on 8-11 when the victim was last seen alive. And then based on those few maggots that were 15 millimeters in length, and that six-point day estimate before those were la eggs were laid for those uh, maggots, that would put the first arrival of the blowflies there on the 12th. And this is also the corresponds with the minimal estimate uh, of overposition or postmortem interval based on the temperature or, or those accumulated degree hours. Then by the 14th, based on most maggots being 10.5 millimeters late 4.6 days before recovery corresponds with the average estimate of overposition or the postmortem interval based on temperature. And this is when the major over, we believe the major overposition by black blowflies occurred. By the 15th, most are first instar larvae. By the 16th, they're most are second uh, instar larvae. And then and by the end of that day, all of the larvae reach the third instar stage. And this also corresponds with the maximal bound or estimate of the postmortem interval based on temperature, as you see here, minimal and maximal shown here on the right. And then, of course, by day six on the 18th is when the victim was found and all of the larvae were relatively mature third end star larvae. So some summary and additional evidence based on temperature dependent development, that is those accumulated degree days that we calculated, and a range in size of the black blowfly maggots recovered from the body, we calculated a post-mortem uh, interval estimate. Some of the flies first accessed the body, as I mentioned earlier, on August 12th, the day after she was last seen, although most arrived on August 14th. An associate medical examiner could not pinpoint an injury that caused the woman's death because of the degree of decomposition, but she could not rule out some sort of neck trauma such as strangulation or knife injury. However, the maggots provided clues. The maggots were confined to the head neck and upper chest, suggesting a wound in the upper chest or neck area, as blowflies will tend to focus egg laying at vulnerable natural openings like the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the groin, as well as wounds. And no maggots were found in the vulnerable groin area. Groin area. Investigators also found blood droplets and splatter in the van owned by the accused that DNA analysis showed came from the murdered woman. The accused was convicted by the jury of murder. This application of forensic entomology to estimate the postmortem interval is only one example of how insects can assist in crime scene investigations. There are several textbooks and popular books available on the subject for those who are interested in learning more about the subject. Thank you, and my contact information here is given below on the slide.